Okay, let's go ahead and start uh, part two of this uh, lecture. Now we're going to be talking about cataracts. So we start things out with a question. And let's start with that. Mr. Hernandez is a 71-year-old Hispanic male who presents to the eye clinic with a chief complaint of trouble with driving at night. In particular, he notes trouble with glares and halos around headlights when he's driving. He's been reading online, as most of our patients do, and thinks it may be time for cataract surgery. All the following, except one, are accepted indications for cataract surgery. Take a moment to read over the answers. You can pause the video if you'd like. If you chose answer C, then you were correct. We do cataract surgery if it's impacting daily living. The cataracts are impacting their daily living. We do it commonly if their vision is only gets to 2040 with glasses. And then for patients who have severe diabetes or other retinal diseases, we may do cataract surgery in order to better view the retina. Cataract surgery. Let's talk about the statistics. Cataracts are the leading cause of blindness worldwide. They affect 24.4 million Americans. And then in general, they affect one in six adults above the age of 40. So not uncommon uh, to see. Here's an example of cataracts and how um, they can affect the clarity of your vision. Typically, in, in when we're born, we're born with a crystal clear lens. That natural lens collects insoluble proteins over time as you live, which result in this scattering of light, and this consequently produces a reduction in clarity of our vision. So this is an example from a case that we did recently here at UofL where actually the cataract was removed in whole. Typically, it's broken up into very small pieces, uh, and you don't have it uh, in whole like this. But what we can appreciate is the blurring of the text behind the cataract. Many of our patients don't even realize how dimmer their vision uh, is because of this collection of proteins. We do cataract surgery on them, and their whole world lights up. It's very exciting for us. Um, Regarding the risk factors for cataract surgery, some of the situations where they can develop a little bit earlier include uh, smoking, UV light exposure, diabetes, intraocular inflammation from things such as uveitis, and then high blood pressure itself. So, cataracts. What is the impact? Well, vision plays a vital role in the physical and mental health of the elderly population, the population that's most commonly infected. There was one interesting uh, study that was done, a randomized controlled trial, which showed that 30, there was a 34% reduced rate of serious falls or fractures in patients who had had cataract surgery in their first eye within a year, which is incredible. I mean, you're talking about, you know, the ability to get around better and not, not have some of these horrible falls that uh, impact the elderly and reduce their independence and end up in causing depression and all sorts of uh, other consequential issues. So not something to take lightly. The visual acuity improves to at least 20, 40 or better in 89 to 96% of patients. So, you know, when you're canceling your patients about cataract surgery, you can tell them there's a really good chance that their vision is going to turn out great. What are some of the interesting surgical considerations that you should be aware of? Uh, well, nearly every case is outpatient and utilizes topical anesthesia and some light sedation, just typically intravenous versed. And it lasts between 15 and 20 minutes on average, sometimes much quicker than that, sometimes longer. Typically, there's no need to stop regular medications. Just remain MPO at midnight and make some minor adjustments to the insulin regimen in diabetics. And then visual recovery takes place within two to three days. Sometimes, you know, some of the ultrasound energy that we use can cause some normal postoperative inflammation. So maybe that vision is not perfect uh, the first day out. So let's play a quick video to demonstrate uh, cataract surgery and some of the basic concepts. Usually with cataract surgery, a small incision is made in the eye. The front portion of the thin outer covering of the lens is opened to allow removal of the cataract inside. 
the cataract is gently broken up and vacuumed out. Then a folded lens implant is inserted through the small incision and into the capsule where it unfolds and permanently takes the place of the clouded natural lens. With the cataract removed, the new lens implant clearly focuses light rays onto the retina. The power of the lens implant is selected for your individual eye. Good, so that's a nice rundown. And then there's some other interesting considerations in cataract surgery now that lens, you can put in premium lenses, which allow patients to see both at distance as well as at near, but that's a little bit uh, beyond the scope of, of this talk. Okay, so that's a little bit about cataract surgery. Now we should discuss glaucoma. And as always, we start with a question. Miss Jackson is a 68-year-old African-American female who presents to her primary care provider with a chief complaint of lethargy. She notes that she's followed her New Year's resolution by making all of her preventative checkups with her doctors this year. In fact, she visited an ophthalmologist last week who started her on a new medication for early onset primary open angle glaucoma. Which of the following option matches her funnest photo with the medication drops she was likely started on? So review those pictures and the medications and pause the video if you need to and, and see what you think. Okay, great. If you chose D, you chose the correct option. Let's quickly review this. So this is a pr picture of classic uh, primary open angle glaucoma. Uh, you see vertical cupping and thinning of the optic nerve tissue. And also latanoprost, we'll discuss this a little, a little bit later, but one of the side effects of that is not uh, lethargy. This is a picture of a retinal detachment. You see fluid beneath the neurosensory retina. This is a picture of a normal uh, optic nerve, no signs of glaucoma. You see, on average, about a 0.3 cup to disc ratio, this being the cup and this being the disc. And then this is glaucoma, and it's associated with a beta blocker, Timolol. We all know that beta blockers can cause fatigue. Sometimes these eye drops can get absorbed a little bit more systemically, especially in the elderly, to cause uh, those symptoms. So glaucoma, let's start with a definition. Glaucoma is commonly defined as a chronic progressive optic neuropathy in adults in which there is a characteristic acquired atrophy of the optic nerve and loss of retinal ganglion cells and their axons. So this is just a figure which kind of discusses what we're talking about a little bit. So your eye has a ciliary body, which is a smooth muscle which produces aqueous humor. Aqueous humor is normal to produce. Uh, provides nourishment for our eye. Typically it drains in, in order to circulate coming forward through the pupil and then coming down close to the iris into the iridocorneal angle and then exit into the exits into the venous system. Well, uh, that filtration process of getting into the venous system is an interesting uh, source of, of concern for glaucoma specialists. One of the theories that we have is that the trabecular meshwork or that netting structure that allows for the exit uh, to the venous system can provide abnormal resistance to outflow. Uh, something that's been studied extensively. And we see that patients who have this higher resistance to outflow end up having a higher interocular pressure, which is one of the main risk factors in glaucoma. That elevated pressure or higher fluid level within the eye causes a squeeze on the optic nerve and cause, can cause damage to uh, ganglion cells and ultimately rob us of vision. Statistically, glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness worldwide. Approximately 3.3 million adults in the U.S. will be affected by glaucoma in 2020. That's a pretty high figure. And there's a three-fold higher risk for African Americans to develop primary open angle glaucoma than non-Hispanic whites. So certainly something you need to talk to your patients about if they have African American race or any family history of glaucoma as well. And this graph just kind of re-illustrates what we were talking about. The higher your pressure, this is on the x-axis, the more likely you're at to have glaucoma issues. Okay, that's not. There's some other factors that go into that, but that's the most important thing for you to think about. 
In glaucoma, we have a wide variety of diagnostic tests that allow us to kind of assess for glaucoma and also its progression. One of the things we do is called a, a visual field test. The visual field test takes about 8 to 10 minutes. A patient is uh, put in a uh, special testing situation where we assess their ability to detect light in different spots of their visual field. What happens is, is a, a light of varying intensity is displayed to the patient and they click a joystick indicating that they can see it. So in this situation, this person doesn't have glaucoma. This inability to see this spot is due to the insertion of the optic nerve in the right eye. However, in these uh, uh, studies, we can see that the patient has some signs of glaucoma. There's dropout of the superior visual field. And these are other kind of associated normal, uh, associated signs of glaucoma as well. Glaucoma is commonly referred to as the silent thief of vision. Unfortunately, many times we ophthalmologists don't get in front of uh, these patients to treat their glaucoma and they end up losing all of their peripheral vision and they finally come to see us when it starts to affect their central vision. See, this patient has complete dropout of their peripheral field and only a central island of vision left. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do <coughs> in that situation. All those uh, uh, axons uh, have been damaged and, and lost from glaucoma. So it's important to see your patients earlier and, and treat and prevent that from happening. We also have ocular coherence tomography like we do uh, in diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration to assess for the anatomy of, of the retinal nerve fiber layer, which thins in glaucoma. Basically what we do is take a picture test of the optic nerve and compare the tissue density to a normal uh, age match database and, and assess to see if you know there are some findings of thinning <coughs> suggestive of glaucoma. And then one of the other things we can do is gonioscopy which evaluates the anatomy of the iridocorneal angle and assesses the trabecular meshwork for uh, glaucoma we are really kind of focusing our talk today on primary open angle glaucoma because that's the more common one in, in uh, the United States. But gonioscopy is also very important in closed angle glaucoma, which can assess for the ability for that aqueous humor uh, to drain out of the eye as well. It has to do with where the iris inserts into the trabecular meshwork. <coughs> the treatment considerations are very similar for primary open angle glaucoma and closed angle glaucoma. We want to get that pressure down. So there are a lot of drops that are at our disposal to, degree, to decrease aqueous humor production and increase the outflow of uh, aqueous humor as well. Latanoprost well, is a very common one that we use. It's often our first one, uh, first drop we put patients on. What it is is a prostaglandin analog that's used once a day, typically at bedtime, to reduce the production of aqueous humor and increase the outflow through uh, a separate pathway that's kind of unrelated to this talk. Some interesting things about latanoprost are that it can cause lightening of the iris color and it can also cause the uh, growth of abnormally long eyelashes. In fact, you may see this product, a sister product of latanoprost known as Latisse, marketed to young females who are uh, interested in having their eyelashes grow longer. Timolol is a non-selective beta blocker that we prescribe to reduce the production of aqueous humor. This is the one that, uh, you know, and sometimes little old ladies can cause lethargy because it does get partially systemically absorbed. Dorzalamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor which reduces the production of aqueous humor. This is generally well tolerated, although it can cause some stinging and transient blurriness of vision. Bromonidine is a common one we use as well, which causes reduction of aqueous humor production and also can cause some increased outflow of aqueous humor as well. This one, uh, unfortunately, can cause quite a bit of side effects. <coughs> it can cause a red, itchy, irritated eye and also can cause some dry mouth. So that's something to keep in mind for your patients. There's also surgical options in glaucoma. One of the things that we do is laser trabeculoplasty. And what that is, uh, for basic understanding, is that 
we apply a shock wave of energy to the trabecular meshwork to improve the drainage outflow. Um, and then we also, if for more advanced glaucoma, can do something called a trabeculectomy, which is where we create a small partial thickness hole in the white of the eye, the sclera, to promote increased drainage. You could think of this as your eye is having a basketball and creating a small thin flap to create a slow leak of fluid out of the eye. And there's other options as well that are beyond the scope of this talk. Primary care considerations for glaucoma. There's intranasal corticosteroids that we commonly use in allergies can elevate the interocular pressure and can be a relative contraindication for someone who has advanced primary open angle glaucoma. So keep this in mind. You may not want to give your patients Flonase who have advanced glaucoma because uh, it can cause some spikes in that IOP. Timolol, as we mentioned, can cause fatigue as a side effect, something to look out for. And in general, if a patient's going to undergo uh, glaucoma surgery, such as the trabeculectomy, we're likely to want to stop blood thinners for about a week prior to surgery based on a bleeding risk. <laughs> Some other basic quick tips that we think you should know about uh, that we're not going to discuss too much in detail include a retinal detachment. Okay, what are the signs of a retinal detachment? Well, patients are going to report flashes of light, floaters, and perhaps a curtain-like effect to their vision. This is going to be due to the, the uh, retinal detachment develops due to the accumulation of fluid between the neurosensory retina and the retina pigment epithelium. This needs an urgent evaluation by an ophthalmologist because it can develop result in permanent vision loss. So basically what you see is a tear. The vitreous gel that fills the normal eye can pull this retina uh, tissue forward and then incidentally allow the opportunity for fluid to collect and then cause a regmentogenous retinal detachment like we see here in this photo. You know, th this needs to be evaluated immediately by an ophthalmologist and you know, at, at our facility, we're on call 24-7, so we'd be happy to, to see any patient uh, you have with these symptoms. And I'm sure it's the same in other academic medical communities as well. And then some basic tips about conjunctivitis. Um, you know, this is commonly seen in the uh, uh, outpatient world. For allergic conjunctivitis, what you could look for under the uh, eyelid is these follicles uh, that collect and are suggestive of an allergic conjunctivitis, the patient will mention itching or bilateral conjunctival injection, uh, and they also will have watery discharge. Or if you're comfortable and the patient also has systemic allergies, you may be comfortable prescribing something called Zatador, which is an antihistamine drop, which also has a mast cell stabilizer as well. That can be applied twice a day for those typical seasonal allergies. Distinguishing between viral and bacterial is a little bit tricky, but we'll give you a few tips. Viral usually has an abrupt onset. There's typically a watery-like discharge, and there's preauricular lymphadenopathy, so you feel kind of their lymph nodes, and they may have a cold as well, due to commonly the adenovirus, and it's self-limited. It will get better after a few days to a week. <coughs> And then bacterial conjunctivitis, typically these patients are going to have, first of all, it's more common in the pediatric population, and viral is more common in the adult population. And they're typically going to have a thick purulence uh, to the discharge. And then one other consideration is that contact lens wears need an ophthalmic exam to rule out signs of an ulcer. If they're having significant pain and thick discharge with this redness, could possibly be a sign of, of a serious ulcer which needs to be treated aggressively under the care of an ophthalmologist. Those ulcers, uh, which are commonly caused by bugs such as Pseudomonas, can wreak havoc on the eye. In general, for treatment, viral conjunctivitis typically needs no treatment. We recommend cold compresses for symptoms and artificial tears that keep the eye nice and lubricated. Whereas for bacterial conjunctivitis, we may prescribe something such as Vigamox or erythromycin ointment, depending on the different considerations uh, for the patient. Okay, this concludes the chronic disease talk, and I hope you guys learned something. Have a great day.